Hey everyone, this is Mike from Accounting for Cycling. As I'm filming this right after the winter holidays, I know there are going to be some of you out there that either received or purchased the new gaming desktop. Uh, congratulations on that and welcome to the PC gamer world. Today we'll be using my iBuyPower Slate Hako Hako 2110 gaming desktop as our test subject here. This is a pre-built desktop that is available from retailers like Best Buy and Walmart uh, or directly from iBuyPower themselves. Uh, they actually don't sell this exact one. They actually uh, start at 16 gigs of RAM, uh, which is actually what we're going to be doing sort of today. We're actually going 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, but this is a i3-12100 processor an Intel Arc A380 6 gigabyte graphics card. So that'll be pretty interesting uh, since there's only, what, three of them on the market right now, um, almost exclusively found inside of pre-builds. And so it also comes with 500 gigabytes of an NVMe SSD, and we'll actually be putting this, uh, we'll see how long or if it works in there. This. XPG SX 8800 Pro that was in my main PC gaming desktop uh, that if you watch my other video of PC surgery you'll actually see it featured in there uh, being switched out with a 2 terabyte Gen 4 drive. Um, other special features of this build uh, it actually comes with only 8 gigabytes of DDR4 3000 RAM uh, which is fine. It will operate on that. It'll work great as an everyday desktop, even some pretty moderate gaming too. Uh, but I definitely would recommend just picking up a kit of 16 gig RAM. Uh, this, I think, at the time of filming this is 50 bucks, so that's pretty reasonable. And uh, Corsair Vengeance is one of the better ones that you can go with. So much like other pre-built desktops on the market, this is designed to kind of entice people who are new to PC gaming um, or people who just don't want to put up with the hassle, struggle, frustration, whatever else might sway you away from building your own system, um, but also wanting to get something that's not just an office looking PC, uh, maybe like an HP pavilion, uh, which I actually used before I built my own desktop. Uh, so that's Nothing against that. Uh, I think I had a Ryzen 2400G and then slapped a 1650 in there after about a year of using it. And worked fine, uh, but it definitely makes you want more. And those bigger pre-builds, uh, for the most part, there's so many custom components in there that you can't really upgrade anything. There's no upgrade path. Things aren't really adaptable. You got goofy power supplies. Uh, weird fits and odd cases that you can't reuse. So going with something like this, uh, this is an iBuyPower case, but at least it offers you the ability, we'll open this up right here, so this is actually a pretty big case, so I'm kind of trying to make sure it fits on camera. So we'll pull the side panel screws off, which I actually kind of like that they're screws, um, because Otherwise, this thing just kind of hangs loose, uh, which is a little frightening. But also, you can see there's quite a bit of good support around the glass, uh, but the edge of the glass does still hold over. Being tempered glass, you really have to watch out for that to make sure you don't have any hard hits on the edges or the corners, because that will cause it to break. All right, and so now we have the inside of the PC. Now I'll actually rotate this, like this, just to make sure we can still get a good view inside. So I really like that this is a full ATX board. It's something that in a lot of these pre-builds you'll kind of get whatever they got in bulk, uh, which is fine. It keeps prices down, keeps things reasonable. Uh, but as far as upgradeability, a lot of that then would mean if you want to add in, say, a streaming card 
or a capture card or even extra USBs, you miss out on the whole bottom chunk of the board. Uh, even things as kind of trivial as an additional SSD slot. What we have here, uh, this is actually not the Intel stock cooler. Uh, this appears to be a deep cool generic Intel one. Uh, I do have an old Cooler Master H212 that maybe for a different video we'll slap this in. The i3 inside of there should be perfectly fine cooling with something that small. Uh, but if I notice it overheats, I can always put this in here. And as far as parts to upgrade, coolers are pretty easy. Uh, thermal paste, I've noticed, kind of turns a lot of people off from doing that because it's not simply plug and play. Uh, but as far as the cooler itself, you basically just unscrew it, pops up. You want to clean off the inside, make sure you get any leftover thermal paste, apply new thermal paste, and then put your new cooler on. Uh, if it's a brand new cooler, might even have thermal paste pre-applied, which is very nice. And so you can see you have one rear fan, which is RGB and addressable RGB. And then up front, there's actually three, uh, also three RGB fans uh, blowing in and then one exhaust blowing out. But this whole top portion is actually also mesh and magnetic. So you actually have a nice dust filter to be able to pull that off. A very important thing with your desktop PCs, uh, the more air they suck in, the more dust will also come in. So having good air filters on there is very nice to be able to keep everything clean inside, keep everything performing well. So obviously this is meant to be more intakes or a different style of intake. Uh, and kind of might not be able to get it because I just clipped my fingernails. Um, but a nice thing to have on a lot of these is actually magnetic. So you don't have to worry about anything wearing out, anything falling, um, or any kind of intricate cleaning. You just kind of pop it off. That allows you to either blow the dust off or vacuum the dust off, uh, which you don't want to vacuum onto the system itself, just to make sure that you don't have any sort of static buildup. All right, and so just by looking into the case, you can see we've got basically just, you've got an addressable, yeah, and a, a cord going out to the fan hub, which also operates the addressable RGB. You have just standard uh, CPU power, which is really nice. So if you do decide to either upgrade the board or if something dies and you have to replace it, uh, if your power supply is good, which is usually one of the sturdiest, longest lasting parts of a PC, as long as it's a halfway decent and fairly efficient, uh, the power supply is likely going to outlast everything else in here. Um, so having just standard ATX style plugs makes it really nice, quick, and easy if you do have to replace anything. Uh, also means too that, say if you want to replace this Intel Arc GPU, you just have a standard PCIe six or eight pin connector. You can see they even tied back the piggyback one. Um, I actually haven't looked inside the power supply basement here. There, there might even be a whole second set there. So if you do want to go to something even more powerful, you can do that. Uh, but for the most part, anything, anything entry level all the way up to quite a few mid-level boards will run off of six or eight pin PCIe connections. So first thing we'll do here, pop out this Neo Forza single, uh, yeah, single side eight gig 
3000 megahertz DDR4 stick. It is nice that it is a black PCB to go with the heat spreader here. Um, I don't know if the heat spreader is really necessarily, well, necessary. Uh, I don't mind having heat spreaders though. At the very least, it gives you a cleaner look. So we'll pull that off the side here. And it looks like we'll have to take the GPU out to actually get to the SSD. So we'll get these cables tucked away just a little bit so they're out of the way. And we can get a closer look at our ARC GPU. So this is my first time at taking this PC apart. I have tested it with 8 gigs of RAM, the included 8 gigs, and then also with the 16 gig kit, uh, one of these Corsair Vengeance LPX kits has actually already been open because it was, up until minutes ago, still in the system. Uh, that's just how I've been operating it, kind of as a HTPC, uh, some light gaming, and then also operating a projector in my office slash bike room. So we'll hit this clip here. Kind of gently, don't want to pull it apart, gently wiggle this around. So it looks like it's just heat pads and some aluminum and a fan. Challenger by ASRock. Uh, so this is the Intel Arc A380. And, I don't know, it's pretty powerful. I've run 1650s before, uh, 1660 Ti's and laptops, uh, 2060 in the original version of my desktop, and then now even a 3070 in there. It, it's by no means going to be your highest performing card available, uh, but it can easily get you into things like GTA 5 at I think I was getting around 100 frames per second in 1080p all high. Um, you'll be able to do things like Call of Duty Warzone, obviously the um, Modern Warfare 1, 2, Black Ops, uh, Cold War, um, definitely going into things like Fortnite, and then any, really any other, especially the modern games, being a brand new line of GPUs, it'll be able to handle those just fine. Once you get to the games that are five plus years older, it can have some struggles, but I've noticed just in the two months that I've had the system, it's almost like every week something gets better. And that's, that's nice, especially since Intel is not giving up. But as far as uh, output on here, you've got three Display Port. I think they're 1.3, and then an HDMI 2.0 out. So, and it will use or it will output to all four if you need that or want that for whatever reasons. Uh, I say whatever reasons as I'm looking at my three monitors and projector. So it does happen, uh, especially if you want one to output directly to. A streaming card or a capture card, you can actually do that and then it really has limited interference with your gaming. So we'll set this off the side here. All right, and now you can see we've got our NVMe M.2 slot. Uh, you can also see this motherboard actually has a USB-C header on it and the case does not. So if you ever did want to hook up USB-C to it, um, you could run another board right out the back um, or you could use one of your PCIe slots to do that as well. Uh, there is a USB-C, uh, I think it's USB 3.2 version 2 for 3.1 maybe. Uh, there's a USB-C port on the back that can run DisplayPort and full data. 
um, at least at 10 gigs a second, so it's at least USB 3.1. Um, but it is nice where you have that. Um, I believe also with this uh, 12100F, you do have onboard graphics. No, sorry, not the F. F series is no graphics. Um, all right, I don't totally know what's in there, but I, I, I know it has onboard graphics. So it's either just the plain 12100, which makes sense. I don't think it's the 12100T. That one runs at, I think it's 35 watts instead of 60. Um, I don't think they cheap that much out on it. Um, but not that there's a huge, it's something like a $10 price difference between the standard 12100 uh, or dipping down the low power 12100T. So this gives us a good look at our Western Digital Blue SN570 500 gigabyte uh, main storage drive. And so the nice thing is you just have NVMe right out of the box. You have super fast storage. And with the way prices have been coming down on these, there's really not much of a reason not to go with some kind of NVMe. And pull this in closer. Perhaps focus. There we go. So as mentioned before, this is an XPG SX8800 Pro, one terabyte M.2 drive. Um, I've used these in quite a few different laptops uh, because they're reasonably priced, great performers. This one just came out of my main desktop. It was my boot drive for about the last four iterations. Uh, so it's gone Intel AM, or AMD, Intel, AMD, and then attempted it with my current i7 Intel, um, as well as going back and forth between integrated and three different NVIDIA graphics cards. So it's been completely wiped and hopefully it can live a good second life just storing things uh, because the biggest problem I was coming across was it would have random boot failures. And that's not something you want. Um, random boot failures, random blue screens of death. Um, you'd be mid Zwift ride, mid Call of Duty campaign, uh, mid paper, or mid video encoding. And it would just stop working. So that's not for that, apparently. <laughs> One of the best low price investments you can get is an M.2 SSD screw kit with a little bit of everything for you. There we are, it's seated in there and it's nice and secure. And we'll put this mini screwdriver back in the baggie with all of the other mini screwdrivers and close it where it goes back into a drawer until the next time I need one. Uh, so at this point we have both of our M.2 slots populated. Um, we do still have four additional SATA 3 headers. 
So if you did want to hook up a two and a half inch SATA SSD or even a hard disk drive, you can do that right over here. Big benefit to that is those go through your controller, not directly through your PCIe lanes. So it won't take any performance away. With this particular setup, I'm not terribly worried about uh, being robbed of any performance. Um, it's mostly once you get into some of the higher end systems or again, if you watch my other video of my main rig, you'll see I have four M.2 drives, uh, four NVMe SSDs, each using four lanes. And so at that point, you have to kind of do a cost benefit analysis of it. And is it worth taking some of those PCIe lanes away from the graphics card? Or do you just want to use something like a bunch of SATA drives for your big data storage? Um, and then pretty much just use one or two NVMe drives for anything that might need that ultra high performance. Now, with how I use mine, I, you know, I'm far from a professional gamer, far from professional uh, first person shooter gamer too. So I'm not too worried about having a little bit of a graphics hit if it means editing videos can be lightning quick or very quick access to data. There we are. Plus, I can always just set up a one of the rigs strictly for gaming. Um, <laughs> benefit to having a whole second system. So that's kind of nice. Um, all right, so now let's upgrade some RAM. You can see I just kind of made sure everything was secure with the graphics card. Uh, even good practice, even with a like an HP or a Dell, good practice is just kind of open up the side, make sure everything is plugged, at least the big plugs are in there tight and correct, make sure nothing's wiggling around, nothing got loose. Um, that way if there is an issue, you can figure it out right away, uh, call customer support, call the store that you bought it from, uh, just kind of see what your options are. Most of the time, it's something as simple as this power connector was shaking a little loose. All you have to do, push it. Uh, saves you a trip back to the store, saves you possibly hours on the phone with customer service. All right, so here's our sticks here. And they've even got a little tiny bit of film that you can remove. Um, I don't believe you have to remove it. I've been using this system for almost two months with it in there, so it hasn't really been bad for it. Uh, so now you'll see I have these gray tabs removed here. So if you look right on the board, so directly on the motherboard here, it says DDR4A2B2 first. And those would be these guys right here. And what that means, and you'll notice too, our original RAM stick was in A1. So those are going to be your primary channels. So if you're running dual channel, just with two sticks, you want to make sure it is smoothly aligned in those slots. Or if somehow a uh, stick ram dies on you or you just want to have a little bit of a different look, nicer, nicer sticks of ram, something like that, you can always replace just the one. So now we're running 16 gigs, 3200 megahertz in dual channel mode. 
So now after installing that new RAM, you'd want to go into the BIOS and make sure that XMP is enabled. That'll allow you to actually use the full power of these. Otherwise they should drop down to 2133 megahertz. That's okay, uh, but I mean, you're leaving performance on the table that you don't need to. All right, and next. Just try to keep tabs on all of this. It's not a bad idea to hold on to your old RAM. Um, it doesn't take up a ton of space. You never know when you might need the original RAM. Um, it's more of an issue on laptops where if you try to enable XMP or any other overclocking on RAM, sometimes uh, you sort of brick the system and that uh, scares, the, scares the pants off you when you're working on your Alienware X17 laptop and it no longer turns on thanks to using Dell's built-in overclocking software because why would they make it so you can't break your laptop? Um, anyways, desktops are a lot more forgiving about that. Um, also a little bit easier to get into if you do need to work on that uh, versus having to rip the whole bottom off and hope you don't touch anything that holds power. So there we are, we've got all four slots populated. And it may seem a little bit of, a little bit like overkill. Um, and it is. Um, but running different things like running streaming software, running, maybe uh, running streaming software, a game, possibly using it as a storage hub later on. Um, yeah. It's not a bad thing to have it fully populated with RAM. And at this point, 32 gigs is, I don't know, I, I feel like it's kind of quickly becoming the, the normal um, if you're going to be going into anything that's streaming or gaming related. Especially too, you can get a 32 gig kit, which would be all four of these sticks, for I believe it's around 80 or $90 right now. Otherwise, these two 16 gig sticks, or two 16 gig kits, so four, or so each of the RAM sticks is eight gigabytes. And the two packs making 16 gigabytes per kit is about $50 right now. So around a hundred bucks, uh, at least future proofs you for RAM. And the nice thing too is so this is a Gigabyte B660 board and depending on how much power is in the power supply, the upgrade path on this is, uh, it's insane. You can go all the way up to the 12th gen Core i9 12900KS um, or KF or any of the 12900 series. Uh, you can also go to the Core i9-1300. So you can, at that point, these uh, VRM coolers, or this VRM cooler, uh, is definitely not going to be enough. You will absolutely want to replace this cooler and not use it with it. Uh, but the nice thing is you've got 360 millimeters of fan space on the front and on the top. So you have a lot of different options for adding in water cooling and a lot of different upgrade paths on here. And if you like the case, the case is just standard ATX case. Um, cable management, not the greatest, uh, but it's not the worst. So, and look wise, it's not too bad. It's a lot of mirrored glass, uh, shines a lot of the RGB straight through it, but also gives a kind of a mirrored frosted or a mirrored shadowed tinted window kind of look to it. So 
what we're going to do is before I put the glass side panel back on, uh, we're going to do two things. I'm going to open up the back panel so we can actually take a look at what's through there. And I'm going to show off the back panel a little bit. Just in case you're still looking for a PC. So I kind of hastily threw the sticker back on here. Uh, you'll see the remove the sticker before use, use these video di for display. Uh, that's like the number one thing that gets people new to PC gaming is they try and plug the video directly in the motherboard because it makes sense. But if you plug directly in the motherboard, you're not going to get any video or at least not the performance you're looking for. Uh, this CPU does have integrated graphics, so that could really throw you for a loop because these will work. Um, so you really want to make sure to plug in the graphics card down here. And that's been a thing that a lot of the system integrators have really been pretty good at is making sure to put a sticker over or something to let you know that you should plug in the graphics card. Um, other parts on the back here. So you have a display port and HDMI out uh, for whatever reason, if you want to run integrated graphics off this. Maybe you're just trying to harvest this sweet Intel Arc A380 GPU uh, for your bigger primary system. Uh, quite a few, uh, five USBs back here. Um, I believe these two are the only USB 3. BIOS update USB labeled for that. Uh, PS2 style keyboard mouse hookup. Uh, and Wi-Fi built in, including the antennas. Those are kind of sitting off the side here. Nice thing with that is you don't have to hardwire. Because unless it has Wi-Fi in it, a desktop is going to have to hook up to Ethernet. Um, or have some form of Wi-Fi hooked up. Uh, that's pretty inexpensive to do. A USB dongle, you can pick one of those up for like five or ten dollars off of Amazon um, and pretty much just plug and play. Um, but it's nice that it's built in. Gives it a cleaner look. It's right on the motherboard. I don't know, quick, simple, out of the box. You've got everything you need to get going. All right, these, well, this thumb screw came loose and this one too. Excellent. Sometimes the thumb screws go on pretty tight, especially right from the factory. They want to make sure nothing comes off, slides off, or rattles around in shipping. So we'll pull that off just like the other side panel. This one you don't have to worry about where you put it. It's steel, so it's pretty solid. Um, it will still bend and dent just as a <laughs> A warning if you're looking at just throwing it across the room. So you have a three and a half inch hard drive cage down here. You can fit two drives down here. Um, it is also adjustable too. So you can completely remove it. You can move it to a different mount point down here, which will move it back and forth away from the PSU. And Let's see if we can get some secrets out of this power supply. Namely being, what is it? Now, iBuyPower's website claims it is a 600 watt, 80 plus gold certified. Uh, does not tell you what it is. 600 watts is pretty good for getting started. That'll be more than enough to power a couple extra peripherals, some extra drives. Here we go. High power. That's a thing. It's overall pretty nice looking power supply. Uh, fairly generic, but nothing bad about it. Nothing special about it. But it is in fact 600 watts. So, slide this back in here. Make sure we don't catch any cables. 
cable management out of the box is actually fantastic. This is an, a great job, um, especially looking at some of the limitations they have of like the length of the USB 3.0 header uh, cable. And pretty close to the maximum you got on there. So you've got kind of just a generic fan header here, uh, complete with RGB. So it looks like you can hook up one more fan to this. And unlike the one on top, the power supply screen is just mesh held on by clips. So something to keep in mind whilst cleaning. But at least it's removable. So even though it's maybe not the highest end, best case out there, there's a lot of considerations that did go in. Uh, you can definitely hard more, or, ugh. You can definitely place quite a few different SSDs in here. There's a lot of customization available. There's a lot of space to work in. And it's a very easy case to work in too. So it may not be spectacular, the best looking one, but it works. And you can see cooling right down the side here. Uh, there's cooling in the middle of the front chassis. So it's, it's a pretty decent airflow case. By no means the best but it's not going to cook your system, especially if it's something that's a little less powerful. So you can see on the front here, the whole front inside is mesh, but it's all behind this kind of acrylic plastic up front here with just a little opening here, the one on the side. And that is oh, one down on the bottom too. So not a ton for airflow. But there's a little bit. Uh, you also have three additional PCIe connections inside. Uh, not that you will probably use all three, but it does give you some mounting options if you do stick a capture card inside of here or some other kind of PCIe connection. Uh, two additional USB he headers uh, for USB 2. Let's see, there's one, two, three, three additional fan headers. This one's marked pump for a water cooler. And then we got one, two, three LED headers. So that, that's pretty good connectability there. Um, and very wide open case, a lot of spots where you put various different things that you might want. Um, yeah, you can even mount SSDs right up here. But let's get the oops, cover on here. Downside. Um, I mean, it doesn't really show that many fingerprints. There's some sweatier ones on there from sweatier hands. All right. It's so now a moment of truth here. Hook this HDMI cable up. And so another benefit of pre-build is aside from modeling, it comes with everything else you need to get started. Not gonna be the best peripherals out there, but they will work. And, oh, these ones are not bad. Uh, so they send you with a membrane keyboard, or uh, a membrane keyboard Sounds like keyboard. The included mouse, I actually found is pretty nice. I mean, it's got this little metal weight bracket down here. Uh, it glides fairly smoothly 
braided cable uh, that doesn't catch on anything. It's decently well built, good feedback. The side buttons are a little squishy. Um, but it is also a selectable DPI mouse. Um, the keyboard even, it's perfectly useful. Uh, if you have $750 to spend on a desktop, it's a good route to go. And they get you everything you need to get started. There we go. So, ah, shoot, I didn't catch it. Well, you can see why I wasn't afraid of putting the side panel on. Uh, we did nothing to the boot drive and nothing that in the system itself wouldn't um, necessarily cause it to fail booting. Our RAM, though, is probably going to be slow. 2133 megahertz so but it is showing uh, four out of four dim slots used yes that's fine um, and if you hover over it I'll show you each one is eight gigs set to 2133 dial in my polarizer here Still not great, but it's showing something. So with the Intel driver support assistant though, it does kind of a nice thing. It shows you all the information about your motherboard as well, including BIOS date, BIOS version, so currently, I believe F21 is the latest stable BIOS for most Gigabyte motherboards. Uh, F22 is coming out soon for something. Um, F21 improved a lot of the peripheral connections and uh, I believe further stabilized 13th gen Intel. So it's always nice to see what the updates are for the BIOS. It doesn't tell you here, but at least then you can go to Gigabyte's website basically just search right from there. Look at that. Here's our motherboard. Um, cool. Dual ultra fast NVMe PCIe 4.0. I did not know that our SSD slots were PCIe version 4. Um, so that's nice. Um, in case I ever want ultra fast speeds on here. And it is USB 3.2 Gen 2x2 Type C. You can see deeper specs. Support is where you would find all of your BIOS information, as well as all of the other drivers, utilities. So like right here, F21 released 11-18-2022. I think yeah, it's showing I got it three days early. Improved linkage between resizable and 4G above. Um, F20, though, was a big update because it was a 13th gen processor update and then also improved your RAM compatibility. So, always nice to be able to see what those changes actually are before just diving right in. Thank you so much for watching today. Please like and subscribe for more content. Uh, if you enjoyed this, check out my other videos. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more updates. Um, and then follow me on social media. Um, also, check the links below. I will have my Amazon affiliate links hooked up there, as well as any other relevant links. Um, I'll try and get this on here, too, uh, because I do think it is a nice base starter desktop. Plus, it gets more Intel Arc GPUs out in the world. And that's how it's really going to take off, is if more actually get out in the wild. Um, so check the links below for all of that information. Um, again, I am Mike from Accounting for Cycling. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.